Hello, argument fans and friends. Welcome to another lecture video. Again, primarily designed for uh, my students here. Where, which way are they? Over here in St. John's University. Normally, we'd be back here somewhere in a, in a dusty old classroom from the 1950s that resembled a hospital, but instead we're online. And uh, I'm not sure um, which is the better case. Anyway, I'm happy to have you here, whether you're a student of mine or whether you are just a random wanderer, rucksack wanderer on the internet looking for interesting stuff. Welcome to this video, which is going to be a discussion of Douglas Enninger's essay, The Uses of Argument. Is it called The Uses of Argument? No, I don't think so. I think I just embarrass the hell out of myself. Uh, argument is method. It's limitations and uses. Um, Douglas Enninger, interesting character, very famous. In fact, there's an NCA National Communication Award, uh, National Communication Association Award named after him for excellence in research and scholarship. Here he is. He was involved in debate. Uh, I know he taught in Florida for a while, but the thing that everyone says about him is his masterful recall and oratorical organizational ability to move through a book orally and lecture about it and keep the organization perfectly great. He was a one-of-a-kind mind who could capture and discuss rhetoric like he had been there at the time of medieval rhetoric or um, other places. Like He was just such a phenomenal thinker and such a phenomenal mind that I hope I can do him justice talking about my favorite of his essays. He didn't, um, he was interested in teaching. He didn't write that much. Uh, he wrote a book. He edited a couple of books. Most famously, he co-wrote with Wayne Brockredy uh, a book about debate, um, which is called Decision by Debate. And that book uh, I have a lot of uh, critique of. I might do another video critiquing that book. I did one already kind of critiquing it, but I might do one where I more thoroughly critique it, where uh, he's uh, at least 50% responsible for this idea that debate is about making better decisions, which is... Uh, kind of a garbage opinion in my view, but you see it ever, you see people saying what debate is about is about making the best decision or making good decisions. I don't know how anybody could believe that, but uh, apparently that's where it is today. I don't think Enninger and Brockredy said that in that book, but I do think that they are setting the stage for, to, to narrow debates possibilities, but this isn't a debate class. So we're not going to trash uh, professor Enninger too much. We're going to praise him because this essay that he came up with is great, and it's worth a read through together. So this video is going to be much longer than my normal videos because we are going to be going through um, this essay uh, together. This is from my last lecture about Toolman. Yeah, here we go. This is what we want. Argument is method, its limitations and uses. And we're going to try to go quickly and try to read through this thing. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to do it, but we'll try to get a sense of it. So. Douglas Sinager's uh, thinking about argument in, the, in a rhetorical way. So what does that mean? Well, rhetoricians are interested in oratory and the creation of meaningful speech. The creation of things that matter, that move people. They get people to reconsider their positions. That's what rhetoric is about. It's about the making of meaning primarily through symbols. Uh, language and words are, are kind of a, a type of symbol. Uh, the way one speaks, the way one dresses and gestures, kind of a symbol. Anything to move an audience to reconsideration. That's what they're primarily interested in. Rhetoricians are interested in the art of discourse. It's sort of the back and forth. And so argumentation and debate fit right in there. Uh, but they're two separate things. A lot of universities have argumentation and debate as one course. I don't think that's appropriate, but I should probably make another video on that. But... Um, Let's look at Enninger's essay and why I might have assigned it to uh, to us in um, this uh, class. Let's make a document here. Um, this will be good. Um, Enninger Douglas Enninger wrote this essay to try to define and understand and explain what he thought argument was. So this is what we would call, and I've talked about this before in the previous videos, this is definitely a, a prescriptive essay, meaning he wants to talk about what argument should be, but also talks about it as if it were already that. Right? So he's someone saying, here's what argument should be, and like I said before in the previous videos, uh, you guys have a choice of how you want to define argument. You can say this is what people do. 
Or you can say, this is what they should do. This is what argumentation should be. This is the aspirational. That's a good word. Let's put that in there. What argument aspires to be. The aspirational nature of argumentation. Um, you can write about that. You say, here's what we ought to do. Here's We're better than this. Here's what we ought to be doing. Or you can say, here's how people argue. How can we make sense of it? How can we teach them how to understand what happens in the world? And I've assigned a, a mixture of, of thinkers on on both of these things. So when we're looking at the essay, let's let's read it together a bit here. When A engages in argument with B, he seeks not to enlarge his antagonist's stock of information, but to disabuse him of error, not to add to B's reper uh, repertory of facts or data, but to reshape her belief or alter an attitude which B already uh, entertains. Okay, so that seems like a pretty nice start. It's whenever I'm arguing with you, I'm trying to alter an attitude or shape a belief. I'm not to, trying to add more facts to you. I'm trying to alter an attitude or a belief. It, so he's distancing argumentation already from it's about collecting facts, which I think a lot of people would be upset with today. Argument, in short, instead of being an enterprise and instruction, is an exercise in correction. Its purpose is not to extend knowledge, but to reform and purify it. Okay, well, I don't know if I agree with that, but let's see what he's trying to say here. It's an enterprise and instruction. It's not an enterprise and instruction, it's correction. So you're trying to reform and purify knowledge. You're not trying to extend it, add to it, create knowledge. You're trying to say, look, the facts are the facts. Knowledge is what it is. Information is what it is, but... Your attitude towards it or your understanding of what it means needs to be corrected. So instead of calling people wrong, he's saying they should be corrected. To place argument in the genus of correction is, however, an in, but an initial step. It is the burden of this paper to refine the description by delineating the methodological assumptions upon which argument as a species of correction rests. To this end, I shall first contrast the arguer's method with another and more familiar sort of correction, that designed to compel or coerce conformity with the corrector's view. So he's saying that what you're not trying to do, don't think of correction as you have to take on my view. Argument, argumentative correction is a very different kind of correction. It's not the correction of like, oh, you're wrong, you should be like me, which is kind of what most people think argument is meant to do. Um, so using this contrast as my ground, I shall examine the boundaries or, or limits uh, within which argument is confined and review the uses to which it may serve. Okay. Correction designed to coerce conformity with the corrector's view takes a number of forms. The teacher points to the facts recorded in a standard textbook or reference work. Okay, this is like the teacher, the bad teacher, I'd say. Like we've all had a teacher like this where they're like, nope, here are the facts, regurgitate them, put them on the test, you're going to fail, I want it exactly like this. And that kind of thing is like, Pretty, pretty bad teaching, but uh, we this model holds up, and we've all had a teacher like this, right? Uh, and if you've ever taught me before and you're watching this, it's not you, okay? I'm not talking about you. It's someone else. Any one of my teachers watching this, it's it's the other, it's that other, you know who it is. You know, it's the other person. It's not you. The layman orders the skeptic to use his eyes and his ears. The father exercises the right of parental control. The propagandist employs psychic or social pressures. The bully resorts to threats and a physical force. In all these cases, to which the corrective act is designed to compel adherence, however, certain common characteristics are present. <clears throat> okay, so this is coercive conformity. Maybe we should write that down. That might be kind of a good one. So, correctors. There's... And these are all people we wouldn't want to be. Bullies. Do you want to be a propagandist? I sure don't. Do you want to be a bully? No way. Nobody wants, nobody, even people who are bullies don't identify as such. Why would they? They don't want to be bad guys. You know? They don't want to be um, terrible people. First, viewed as a process, the correction is unilateral. The lines of influence flow in a single direction from the corrector at one pole of the transaction to the correctee at the other. I turn my phone off. My goodness. 
Not only does the corrector initiate the exchange and direct it throughout its history, but he also dictates the conditions under which it will terminate. His sole aim is to secure compliance with the correctee's assent if possible or without it if necessary. So here's somebody who just knows they're right and they're going to get their way. Although the corrector may hope that the reasons for his directive become apparent and that the response will therefore be voluntary rather than forced, under normal circumstances he will not hesitate to impose such penalties or offer such rewards as facilitate the achieving of his goal. The correctee, by contrast, is cast in an inert and passive role. He is merely the object to which the correction is directed, the sink or receptacle into which the approved information is poured, the body whose behavior is to be modified. Gosh, this is like, we've all been in that class, right? Where it's like, you're going to change, I'm not going to change, here's what we're going to do, do it or fail. I'm going to bend you towards the facts. It's a very inhumane way to try to make people better. But I mean, maybe the bully or the propagandist isn't, they're not really interested in making people better, right? They're interested in submission. They're interested in coercion. They're interested in forcing people into a view. In every respect, the relationship is one in which a person who possesses superior knowledge or authority admonishes another who is inferior in these respects. Second, Correction that is coercive in nature does not in principle admit of various levels or kinds of success. Either the correctee obeys as ordered, in which case the corrector succeeds completely, or he fails to do so, in which case the effort must be written off as a failure and punishments of one sort or another imposed. A compromise in which the correctee agrees to split the difference between his original response and the one required is not regarded as satisfactory. So this is the time when you don't agree with the professor and you write the paper and you say, this is what the ideas are from the professor, but I disagree. I, I'd modify it this way. And you still get an F because you didn't fully go with what the professor said the interpretation was. This is the kind of correction that, I mean, Enninger is against this. Make sure you understand he's against this, but... It also is kind of making me think, well, what kind of theory of argumentation is this where he's talking about bad teaching or bad correction, like propaganda? What a weird way to start. I mean, he's trying to define argument too, just like I'm asking you to do in the final exam. So what, what kind of, where are we going with this? Third, in coercive correction, the corrector's own attitude towards the rule he is enforcing or the fact upon which he is insisting is not a relevant concern. He may be strongly convinced of its validity or importance, or he may regard it as invalid or trivial and therefore require adherence only because a higher authority demands that he do so. Whatever his attitude, the desired alliter uh, alteration of belief, I almost said alliteration, that's kind of a good slip. The desired alliteration of belief. That's kind of funny. Um, the desired alteration of belief or action still will be affected. The frequently heard excuse, I do not make the rules or invent the answers, I only enforce them stands as proof that in the species of correction, the attitude of the corrector is not germane. So even the corrector is under the thumb of forces beyond their control. This is how it is. This is just what this class is. I don't make the rules. You have to pass the test. The test, the points, that's the thing. It's not up to me. You have to pass these things to prove that you're good at this or you're going to fail the course. Fourth, because coercive correction is by nature unilateral, because the lines of influence and control flow only from the corrector agent, to the correctee as object. Though the corrector may under certain circumstances expose himself to physical danger or social opprobrium, he runs no risk to his own integrity as a person. No risk that as a result of his action, his own orientation and outlook, his own constitutive pattern of attitudes and convictions will have to be radically altered. So this is like, you're going to change 100% and I'm going to change zero. As the corrector, I change zero. It's not in the cards for me to change. It's not in the cards for me to correct or alter my way in any, in any form or fashion. You're going to change 100% and conform to exactly what it is that, um, that I say is right. This is not what Inninger wants argumentation to be. This is not, he's not even saying argumentation is this. You know, he's saying uh, this is what argumentation isn't. It is not this kind of correction. Okay. Just making sure you're following along here. So let's go to section two here because we kind of get, we get the gist, Doug, okay? Like kind of driving it home. But this is the way academics have to write. These are the rules of academic composition. You have to make an argument that has to be extremely clear, extremely laid out. That's just the way it's done. And from your point of view, you might say, wow, this is a big waste of words or something. But last I checked, words are not a, a critical natural resource. We have plenty of them. Uh, all you have to do is turn on CNN to see how many words we can waste in 20 minutes. 
uh, and throw away to the winds and not have to worry about it because there's always more. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's just you, you might not ever write academically, but it's important to know how to read it because there's so many good ideas in academic publishing that it's a shame that people don't go look at it uh, more often. There's lots of reasons for that. One is paywalls. It's very expensive to access these journal articles. You're very lucky you have access to the library. It would cost you uh, probably three or $400 to read this article without the library's um, login. So think about that next time you're like um, wondering about the value of this stuff. It's heavily paywalled. Uh, and secondly, it's just very difficult to read and most people don't read enough to practice uh, to have their their um, uh, their reading metabolism up enough to process this kind of stuff. Uh, it's just like if you tried to run a mile and you haven't been to the gym in six years, you're probably going to die, right? You're just going to fall over and be like, my heart, I'm in pain. But like, no, you're just really out of shape. But somebody who goes to the gym for 30 minutes, does 30 minutes of cardio every day, if they have to run a mile, they could probably do it. It's the same thing with reading. If you If you do your reading cardio every day, 20, 30 minutes, you can read more difficult stuff if you have to. But you might say, wow, that was a hell of a workout. I don't want to do that again. I'm going to go back to my 30 minutes of uh, Harry Potter or whatever every day that you like to read. And that reading is still practicing reading. Right? All right. So now by way of contrast, let us consider the case of the arguer who convinced that another's beliefs are invalid or pernicious, attempts to set the party straight by engaging him in argument. This is what the good guy corrector does. In what ways does the arguer's method of affecting correction differ from the coercive or constraining sort of correction described above? First, and of crucial importance, it should be observed that in this new situation, the lines of influence, instead of flowing only in one direction, flow in two. Okay, that's a huge change. The corrective process, instead of being lateral, is bilateral. Bilateral, that means it's going both ways. So instead of me telling you what to think and you moving towards me, I'm telling you what I think and you're giving me feedback? You're pushing back on it? We're, we're moving together in some, it's more like a kind of a this rather than a, I'm here and I'm bringing, I'm pulling you towards me like with the force or something. It's more of like a kind of a back, we're moving around. In choosing to argue with another, rather than employing some form of coercion to achieve his end, the protagonist enters into an agreement of a special sort. This is the most important part of the essay, actually. This is to give his opponent an opportunity to correct him, not only by presenting the other side of the issue, but also by probing the, uh, the pertinence or wisdom of the correction urged. So when you think about this moving, it's like when I enter into an argument with you, it's a special arrangement of like, I'm trying to change your attitude or your opinion about something. And as you talk back to me or ask questions, then you can also change my mind. Once the door is open, it can swing both ways is what Inager is saying. So when I engage someone in an argument, I'm, I'm, I'm assenting to this idea that my mind could be changed too because the power doesn't just work one way. Or maybe this is the attitude of the corrector. Maybe it could just work one way. But if you're a coercive corrector, you're just like, I'm not interested in that. I'm changing you. I'm not interested in what you think. I'm changing you. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's more of an attitude about argument itself. Were this opportunity not offered and implemented by appropriate behavior on the antagonist's part, the interchange would die a borning. And even though the protagonist might not present an abundance of evidence to support his view, he would still be attempting to, grant, to gain his end unilaterally. Okay. Because argument is bilateral, because it is an essential aspect of its method, the antagonist is granted an opportunity to weigh the case presented to him and to probe it for weaknesses or errors. The correctee, instead of being an inert object or a sink, remember the idea of sort of dumping the information or dumping what you're supposed to do into the other person. It's an active participant in the correction process. Initiative and control, instead of resting entirely with one party, pass back and forth as each expounds his own view and criticizes the view of the other. Do you think the presidential debates are like this? I don't know. I kind of feel like the presidential debates, by Inninger's view, are not argumentative correction at all. So we wouldn't see any of this happening in a presidential debate, would we? It's an interesting take. I just thought of that right now. I wonder about that. It's interesting. Nor would the protagonist as corrector have it otherwise. In selecting argument as his instrument, he announces to his opponent and to the world that rather than seeking compliance on any terms, he seeks a particular sort of compliance, one which, because it rests on understanding and honors the principle of free choice, may properly be called assent. So assent is the better version of 
coercion. Assent means I freely choose to change my attitude based on the reasons that you gave me, like reason giving discourse. So this is a very sort of high model of argument, maybe even an ethical one, that agreement by coercion, like I'm going to kick your ass if you don't agree with me, is not an ethically legitimate or even a legitimate at all form of argumentative work. On the contrary, someone saying, I didn't agree with you, and now that I've seen the reasons, I now agree with you, that's like the highest level, assent. I, by my own free will, choose to assent to the arguments that you're presenting. That's the highest level for an injury here. By employing only those facts and um, interferences for which he is, or inferences, sorry, not inter these slips are really interesting. I should go back and retype it with all my Freudian slips in there and see what it says. By employing only those facts and interferences for which he is willing to be held responsible. Can you quiet the dog down? Are you responsible for that dog bark? I am. I am. I honor this principle. I am responsible for the dog bark if it influences you. By employing only those facts and inferences for which he is willing to be held responsible, by granting his opponent an opportunity to consider and to reply, the protagonist hopes that this party will, in effect, come to correct himself. So it's like the idea of like, you're going to change your mind. I can't do it for you, but I can move you for you to engage your own mind and change it. It's really up to you. I'm not asserting any dominance or control over you or telling you what to think. You're going to change it on your own based on what I'm saying. It's a very high level kind of argument theory, isn't it? Very noble too, right? And very respectful. Like the key words here are like respect and ethics in this, in this, in this theory of argument, isn't it? Yeah, fascinating. Were this not the case, the protagonist surely would reject argument in favor of persuasion by the more dependable means of physical force, force or psychic coercion, gaslighting or ass kicking is what those two things might be, but not in that order. Gaslighting would be psychic coercion, like trying to make somebody uh, think that they have interpreted what they saw wasn't real or what they feel isn't real, that kind of thing. Um, it's getting kind of dark out. I hope you guys can still see me okay. Let me look. Yeah, okay, you can see me just fine. Actually, it kind of looks like I'm in this just nether place. Um, you can't see my windows or anything. It's kind of cool. Um, but yeah. Anyway. This video is going to be way too long already. Second, the, <laughs> the correction advanced by the arguer, unlike that employed by the teacher, parent, or propagandist, is enforceable neither by fact nor by fiat. Fiat means that by the statement, because of the power in the person, by the statement of it, it happens, right? There's no grounds for, for uh, objection or anything. So once something becomes a law, uh, that's what you're going to have to do, and it's just by fiat. You, you're not in the position to argue against it. You can contact your congressperson and fight against the law and say the law should be changed, but it's by fiat. You have to, it, this is the way it is by virtue of the power of the government or the teacher saying, uh, in the free speech unit, we're not going to, we're not going to be allowed to speak. You have to write quietly. We're not going to do group work in the work on, in the unit on interpersonal communication or whatever. It might not make any sense, but by the power of that person, they make it the reality, even though no one agreed to it. At that level, right? Instead, it rests on the unstable ground of probabilities and values. So uncertainty is the grounding by which good argument happens. Now, what does he mean by that? On estimates, then in the end, it may turn out to be false, and on judgments concerning not how the world is, but how in the opinion of the protagonist it ought to be. Now, that's interesting. So the grounding of good argumentation is on uncertainty because the protagonist is saying, this is how you should be. Now, there's so many variables there. How can the protagonist, the person initiating argument, be certain that they're standing in a good place? Well, they can't be. But that's why they have to enter in that corrective bilateral relationship to make sure the argument is good. Where constraining proofs are available, argument is superfluous. For here, the proper procedure is at most to explain or review the proof by which the rule is established or the fact verified, and at the least command adherence. Only when the evidence falls short of a demonstration is argument an appropriate tool. So if you can't just go look it up, if you can't just find it demonstrated in a, a law or principle somewhere, argumentation is the tool you want. If not, it's not the best tool. Third, in contrast to correction of the coercive sort, the correction enga engaged by the arguer permits of various levels and kinds of success. This is when I kind of feel, feel like it's a success when I'm arguing with somebody who's very different from me in politics. And they say, well... I can see where you're coming from. I'm like, oh, that's a win. 
Because it's so difficult to try to get people to see your, your way in the world. It's the most difficult thing, I think. That it's good to say, well, I can see where you're coming from. I can see why you think that is a big win. And over time, maybe you've planted seeds that will make them reconsider their position. There's different kinds of success. Sometimes you'll be in a really bad argument where somebody might say, well, let's agree to disagree. That could be success because you haven't lost your friendship. You haven't lost your relationship over your disagreement. Let's agree to disagree. Okay, that, what does that mean? Well, we're not going to make this a center point of our relationship. This is something we can disagree about and put to the side, but it's not going to corrupt our entire relationship. For while total agreement in the form of capitulation might be the result of the protagonist prefers, of course, everybody wants to win. In those myriad cases in which there is much to be said on both sides of an issue, it would be strange indeed to regard as a complete failure a case that eventuated in a compromise or won a qualified acceptance. Moreover, proof in the abstract as an accumulation of evidence and an inference sufficient to establish a claim in principle must be distinguished from proof to a person as an accumulation of evidence and inference, which does, in fact, affect conviction in a given instance. So arguing in general in the abstract is not like it was arguing with people. And and every kind of person is going to have different kinds of conviction in relation to what you say. It's kind of similar to Toulmin, isn't it? The arguer, no less than the person who uh, engages in a rhetorical effort that is unilateral in nature, can hardly be said to have failed if within the limits set by his method he overlooks no possibility for attaining his end. What? Okay, so I think what that says is how could you fail if you did everything you could to persuade somebody, to get them to change? I did everything I could. I used every piece of good evidence. I said everything I could. That's a success too. So maybe success in method. It's hard to accept, isn't it? The idea that you could like say, I'm actually pretty good at arguing even though no one's agreed with me. It's kind of what he's saying, right? Well, maybe not in all cases. Fourth, as contrasted with coercive correction, where the attitude of the corrector is irrelevant in argument, the attitude of the corrector is of crucial importance. In choosing argument as his instrument, the protagonist at the outset sets himself off from the naked persuader on the one hand and from the neutralist on the other by assuming a posture of restrained partisanship. Okay, so this is a lot here. So when you choose argument, you are setting yourself off from a partisan position. You're invested in what you're saying. Unlike the teacher who's invested in you doing the right thing or following the rules, that's what they're sort of invested in. That's the, um, that's the, the, the disassociation of the personal from what the teacher wants to do and from what the propagandist wants to do. They're like, no, this is just true. It's nothing to do with me. That's not the way argument is. You take on the role of a partisan. You're invested. You're like, there are multiple sides, but this is the best one, and here's why. And that's where argument starts as a corrective. Uh, you're not, I, I guess, and you're saying you're not really arguing if you're doing this coercive stuff. I think that's what he's saying. Hey, we're back. Um, Let's see. Okay. So where were we? I took my headphones off. When did that happen? What was I even listening to? At the same time, by selecting the bilateral method of argument rather than the unilateral methods of force or suggestion as his correct 
corrective tool, he voluntarily places upon his effort limits which curve its persuasiveness. So he's saying, I, I could totally get you to believe me, but those methods are illegitimate. I'm only going to use these particular methods, and that's where I'm going to hold myself. This is like the definition of ethics, right? I understand what I could do, but these are the things that I ought not do, and you push those aside. In contracting to submit his directive to examination rebuttal, he sets his case on its own legs, asks that it be given only that degree of credence, which upon study is found to deserve. So even though you like me, I want you to push that out of the way and just look at the case and look at the information directly. That sounds kind of like Socrates, doesn't it, when you read these Socratic dialogues? We don't care about what you feel about me. I, I don't want you to accept things because I've said them. I want you to accept them because you believe them too. And they say, okay, Socrates, let's get into the questioning. And off they go, right? So it's a similar kind of thing, like, Whatever you personally feel about me or about us, that's not on the table right now. Let's look to what kind of evidence or what kind of support these ideas have. Um, instead of avoiding or short-circuiting the reflective process, the protagonist addresses it head-on and in a sense stands poised between the desire to control and the conviction that whatever control he achieves shall be achieved only in the right way and for the right reason. The antagonist also must play the role of a restrained partisan, must stand poised between the desire to maintain his present view and a willingness to accept the judgment which a critical examination of that view yields. Bilaterality, in brief, while a necessary condition for argument, is not a sufficient one. Yeah, that's right. You could have a conversation and be bilateral, both exchanging views and going back and forth. So what's the difference then? It's not necessary. This is kind of a philosophical position, right? It's not sufficient. You can't just have an argument if you see bilaterality. That's not enough of a definition to make something an argument. However, um, it's a necessary condition. You can't have argument without it. So think about that as a terms of a, of a definition. What's essential and absolute and what is foundational? So it's a necessary one. You have to have bilaterality, but it's not sufficient. You have to have more to have an argument. That's what he's saying. There has to be more. There must be a consciously induced state of intellectual moral tension precariously maintained in the face of strong drives to thwart it. So... We are committed to an intellectual and moral project here. Even though we'd like to shout at each other, we'd like to try to trick each other, we'd like to try to make each other believe and be like, thank God they're doing the right thing. Nope. We have to defer to argument as a process where we calm down, where we say we are trying to enforce, I mean, passionately enforce these moral and um, uh, intellectual rules that argument requires. When such tension is absent, the motive to reflect or resist correction is lacking and no interchange occurs. Yeah, so you're like, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. You get mad. You, you double down on your own view. Or you say, "Why you're such an idiot. Why can't you believe me? This is the kind of thing that happens when we lose track of the larger structure of argumentation. When, on the contrary, tension becomes too great, the bond of common interest by which the conflicting drives are held together breaks, and one or both parties, losing the requisite poise, resort to psychic or physical pressures to enforce their views. Just as the strings of a violin must be neither too slack nor too taut, if the instrument is to perform properly, so much the threads which unite the parties to an argument be precisely tuned. So this is a structure we have to maintain, and we have to consciously maintain it, or we'll just be shouting at each other. Fifth, whereas correction that is coercive entails no risk to the corrector as a person, correction through argument is a very real sense a person risking enterprise. Now this is the famous line from this essay. Argumentation is a person risking enterprise. What does he mean by that? I thought argumentation was supposed to be nonviolent. I'm going to risk my life. Let's see what he says. By entering upon an argument in any but a playful mood, a disputant opens the possibility that as a result of the interchange, he may be persuaded of his opponent's view. This is bilaterality working here. It's like they start making objections, and you're like, oh, that's a pretty good objection. Oh, that's a pretty good question. Oh, maybe I am wrong. And then you start to hate that feeling. You start to move towards kind of the things that are not argumentation. And Andrew would say, nope, keep your mind on the moral and intellectual rules here. Remember, we're looking at only the things that are given appropriate credence. We're examining here. We're not trying to be absolutely right. We're examining. And it's a bilateral thing. And that's the only way argumentation works. Or failing that, at least may be forced to make major alterations in his own. He 
you might be persuaded of your, or you might have to change your viewpoint. In either case, you will emerge from the interchange with a different pattern of convictions, values, and attitudes than he held when he entered it. This is what's interesting about even people who are very convicted. Anytime they debate, they're like, no, I didn't change my mind. I, I feel like I'm right as ever. They'll have new reasons for why they're right. It even alters it. Even if there's something you would never change your mind about, if you argue with someone about it, you're going to have new reasons for why you're right and new ways to talk about it. And that's the beauty of, of going to and attending and participating in debates and arguments about things you'd never change your mind about. So to this extent, he'll be a different self or a different person. And obviously, this is exactly what he does not wish to happen. For if he were indifferent or passive willing to be remolded as another desires, he would not have engaged in an argument in the first place. He would not have undertaken to uphold by evidence and reasoning the pattern of convictions or values which he originally entertained. By laying on the line for examination and criticism of you, in which he believes so strongly that he not only wishes to maintain it, but also to impress it upon others, the arguer lays himself on the line also. Were he not willing to face these risks to his own orientation and integrity as a person, he would seek to avoid or to stifle opposition rather than to invite it. So it's really kind of a thing of like, if I'm so right, why would I risk being wrong is kind of the, the anti-debate attitude, the anti-argument attitude. So why would he do this? Well, he believes it so much that he wants other people to come to that conclusion on their own by changing their own attitude and mind about it. So this is kind of like a gift one gives that's very high risk. I know I'm risking myself, my attitude, everything I believe in, but I respect you so highly, this is the only way that I want you to come to the decisions that I have come to. In correction of the corrective genre where commitment it, to end is paramount and commitment to method is secondary. The person may be sheltered or bypassed. Remember, it's not me. This is the law. These are the rules. This is what science says. It has nothing to do with me. Submit to the logic. Submit to the facts. That's the bad corrector. The argumentative corrector is, I'm invested in this personally, and I want you to be too, and here's how I've come to see it. It's very personable, it's approachable, and it's very risky to do that because if they push back, you might change your mind. We don't want to do that. You might have to give up your long-held beliefs, and you don't want to do that. Although it's good to do that, none of us want to do that. We never want to say we're wrong. That's a hard thing. But it's so good to be able to do it. It's so good to talk with smart people and realize how wrong you were. I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful thing, but it sucks at the time. In review, then, the correction of the arguer is bilateral and non-enforceable, permits the various levels and kinds of success, demands a posture of restrained partisanship, and places the person in a position of genuine existential risk, not like violent life and limb risk, but existential risk. I don't know who I am anymore if I can't believe this. So you can imagine religious argument where the, the convicted um, Catholic person tries to persuade the atheist, and the atheist gives lots of good reasons why it's not true. They start to doubt their own faith. That can be super um, traumatizing. But that's the risk we take in argumentation. That's why argumentation is so beautiful and powerful is you'd never be able to have the conversation with the atheist uh, in the first place or have the chance of them thinking about their own views, which they might be doing. It's not necessarily a one-way street in terms of result. Bearing these characteristics of the arguer's method in mind, let us next consider the limitations to which his method is prone. So these are the problems argumentation can have. First, argument by nature is indecisive. Second, it can encompass only those situations in which mutually exclusive alternatives present themselves. So it's indecisive. We're never quite sure if we've got the right answer, right? It's always moving. Well, there's always another response. So usually arguments are ended because of time or because of energy, people get tired, or because they have something else to do, another commitment. So they can't argue and argue and argue. They're always indecisive. It always comes to an end. Second, only mutually exclusive alternatives present themselves, which means you can't argue unless you have two things you can't do at the same time. We can either go to Taco Bell or Wendy's. We can't go to both and eat there. I mean, you'd be very sick, I would think. Third is imprisoned in the world of words. I wonder what he means by that. And fourth, it addresses itself exclusively to means and never to ends. So it's about what we should do and what actions we should take and not whether those results are going to be good. It's not like scientific proof or proof about like, well, is this going to work in some way? I think that's what he means anyway. Argument as method is indecisive because it has no built-in stage of resolution towards which it is directed in terms of which it reaches completion as a logical and psychological whole. Arguments as acts are initiated when an existing belief or condition is challenged with a view to substituting some alternative belief or condition, which the protagonist as issuer of the challenge prefers. 
supported by evidence, inherent in, in inference sufficient to make out a prima facie case. A prima facie means at first face. It means all the evidence is there for something that could persuade. Whether it actually persuades is a different story, but everything is there that needs to be there to make that work. Then you are a good, a good starting point for argument. Such a challenge poses a threat to the party who favors things as they are. We prefers a reordering different from the one proposed. This is a very long essay. I don't think we're going to be able to... Are we going to get through all of it? Oof. This is a lot. Okay. Unless this party is willing to see his cause fail by default, he is therefore obliged to bestir himself, and assuming the role of an antagonist to come forth with responses, with each or either will turn back the initiating challenge or implant a preferred substitute in his place. So... What we've done so far, I think I'm going to... How long have we been talking here? Oh, geez, 40 minutes. Okay, so I think we might end there for now and say in section one... Well, first of all, we learned Inninger's thesis. Maybe we should write this down in our um, handy-dandy little chalkboard here. So in section one, he started defending his thesis, but what is his thesis? Argumentation is a special kind of correction. It's not coercion, where you're forcing someone to do something. But it's also not like, um, it doesn't deal with um, uh, facts. That's a weird definition of argument. So in section one, bad coercive correction. Section two, how argument is good correction. In section three, which we'll do in the next video, will be, um, uh, what was he talking about? Um, limitations of argumentation. And that might be something you want to consider in your own, uh, in your own um, work, is this idea of, um, here he is again, Douglas Energy. Smart guy, don't you think? This is a very thorough and very highly organized essay. Everyone who was a student talks about him this way, that he was like, he could just kind of speak in a beautiful outline format. And you can see he can write in that way too, but uh, Integer is interested in a very special kind of understanding of what argumentation is. And in section three, we're going to find out the limits of that. And then in section four, kind of what we're supposed to do with it. So in the next video, sections three and four.